It's indeed a great privilege. Uh, today we have got with us Professor Mahendra Lama, an economist, strategist, and a great soul who is working tirelessly on various projects related to India's economic growth, India's uh, strategic relationship, partnership in South Asia, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, and of course with Far East and other places as well. And of course, uh, he visited uh, in recent past for two years China as well as a visiting professor. Hearty welcome, Professor Saab. Thank you. It's such much. a great pleasure that you are here today with us. Thank you very much. We wish to take on different areas of the Asian continent. Sure. And uh, as Asia is becoming the economic hub, economic power, and a uh, couple of developments are taking place in this region. So, in your own order of priority, whatsoever you feel appropriate, you can take it on. We wish to discuss something on China. Mm -hmm. We want to discuss something on Southeast Asia. With Southeast Asia, we also want to discuss our Northeast part of India. And at the same time, we are also very keen to know from you, being an expert, regarding our relations, future relations with Nepal with Sri Lanka, with Maldives, Bhutan and other places as well. Choice is entirely yours, whatsoever sequence you want to start, whatsoever way you want to start, let's have it that way. Economic impact we want to take on the whole. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for more importantly for inviting me here. It was a lovely session with the students today. They also enjoyed yes, I enjoyed uh, uh, my interactions with them. Yes. I think we should... Uh, India has a very interesting situation today as a country. First is what is happening within India, right? And what is happening in the region that surrounds India. And thirdly, what is happening in India and the global world, a yes. larger world, right? Yes. So it's very interesting to see, first let's see India within India, hmm. uh, many things because many people, many institutions have said that uh, India is going to be a major economic power in the course of the next 30-40 years. And there are adequate indicators that we are moving towards that, right? Uh, for example, um, the way we have done our trade, the way we have done our manufacturing sector, agriculture sector, and uh, services sector, services sector, right? Yeah. So, um, I think there are adequate indicators. But I think uh, at the same time, we also know that uh, this is not enough, yeah. right? Much more to yes. If we see what has what uh, a country like Korea did, Singapore did, China, Japan, even some of the Latin American countries like Brazil, Argentina did. I think we are still not moving the way we should be moving. So you talk about the pace? Pace. Okay. Yes. The pace, right. And, uh, and the other thing within this is, you know, uh, the pace has to be uh, such that it takes the entire country along with it. Mm. You can't say that uh, South India and West India are doing well, East India and Northeast India are not doing well, North mm. India is not doing well. Mm. So I think one of the ways forward for all of us is to really take the entire, galvanize, mobilize and really take the entire country together. And this is what has happened uh, in, uh, in many other countries. China, of course, very lately realized that you know, what really happened in the coastal areas in the eastern part of China, including Shanghai, you know, Fujian, all these provinces, uh, they said that only these uh, coastal regions developed, not the southwestern part of China, including Tibet, Sichuan, Chennai, right? So they started, they quickly concentrated. So that quick, quick, quick shift to 
underdeveloped geographies also happened almost 18 years back okay. in China. In our case, we have not started. Northeast still remains a pocket which is a laggard in development. Yeah. Which has tremendous potential. Absolutely. Mm. So this is, in the, the, the second thing is, I think uh, in our country, we really have to build institutions, mm. right? Mm. Uh, which would really get the Political will is fine, governmental policy is fine, but what is very important is how do you institutionalize them, what kind of institutions you have created, and which institutions will really carry them forward, mm -hmm. right? We really have to strengthen our institutions. And third, of course, is we need uh, something like a solid uh, human resource base. Mm -hmm. You know about it, right? Mm -hmm. You have been working on this. Mm -hmm. Unless uh, you create a very critical mass of human resources mm -hmm. across the country, across the sectors, right, across the communities, uh, it would be very difficult to really take it forward. Mm -hmm. So it is in the interest of the country that institutions, which the geographies which do not have institutions mm -hmm. of of the top order, like say you have very good institutions in Bangalore. Uh, Calcutta, Delhi, Mumbai, Hyderabad, such kind of institutions have to be replicated, created in institutions where, where you don't have. So like, let's say, for example, Patna, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for example, UP, any uh, in a place like Allahabad or Lucknow or Gorakhpur, mm -hmm. you don't have such kind of institutions. So these are the three things. Okay, institutions, when you talk about you are referring to educational institutions? No, all kinds of institutions. All kinds of institutions. Yes, scientific, okay. professional, okay. educational, technical, okay. all kinds of institutions. Does that uh, involve the industrial part? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. And, and institutions. Comes with ecosystem. <coughs> yes, both public and private. Both public and private. Now, where are the institutions that would devote time to do infrastructure projects? Okay. Like roads, communications, transports, right? Okay. Waterways. How do you look at the entire development uh, which is taking place in China? If you could educate us a little bit, how China is working, what is the psyche of China, what is the development process or procedure or a strategy in China? You see, if you see, China has had a very tough time hmm. and as compared to us, they have suffered a lot. Hmm. Uh, one of the very remarkable way of looking at China's progress is uh, China really suffered and it hit the ground uh, and again it was raised from the ground mm -hmm. right exactly what happened in Japan mm -hmm. but the incidences in China and Japan are <coughs> different mm -hmm. in China you had the cultural revolutions from 66 to 77 right and that had almost ruined the country mm -hmm. there are books by uh, Chang and Halliday would say that almost 7 to 8 million people died. Oh. 80 lakh people died in China during these 10 years. Last many institutions were demolished. Oh. The country was totally disoriented. Oh. Right? So China picked up after the death of Mao Zedong. Uh, a leader like uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, really took it off. Right? Oh. And that made a huge difference in China. Similarly in case of Japan. Hmm. After the Hiroshima Nagasaki uh, atom bomb droppings, hmm. right? And the, that country was really ruined, it was really grounded and started taking off. So, but China did two, three things which was very remarkable after the after 1979 uh -huh. when Deng Xiaoping said. Uh -huh. Deng Xiaoping uh, started policies related to uh, openness. Okay. Yes, you really open uh, uh, what uh, Gorbachev did in Russia, uh, Soviet Union. Uh, uh, they had a policy like Glasnost and Perestroika, that means openness and restructuring of the projects. Exactly in China, they started restructuring the entire process, opened the economy, and two, three things really helped them. One was the uh, the 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 non residents Chinese investment in China. Oh. That itself became a huge contributing factor to China. Oh. Secondly, since the since the uh, the production manufacturing uh, uh, the ecology 
was much more uh, better there. Uh, all the top world companies, particularly from Japan, like uh, like uh, Sony, mm -hmm. uh, any Panasonic, national panels, they were Panasonic. opened their shops in China. Mm -hmm. So they so they had a liberal labor laws, low wages, raw materials were available. So instead of producing any Japanese product in China, in Japan, they started producing the same product in in in, in, in China. Because economically it was more feasible, mm -hmm. viable. So mm -hmm. today you will find Sony camera uh, mm -hmm. made in China, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. actually it is Japanese. Japanese. Okay. So and they started doing that. Uh, the second thing they did was. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, they uh, really started producing for trade, mm -hmm. huge trade, mm -hmm. and grades, grades of the, the trade. Uh, they, they started producing same, say for example, same set of uh, textiles, one set of textiles for American market because they can absorb at a high cost. Mm -hmm. Then the second set for a market like uh, Germany, France, third a market like India. Such kind. So they had greatest and greatest. So and that gave the economic prosperity so and economic freedom. Okay. And they gradually shifted to much stronger industries. Okay. Right. And when they shifted to heavy industries like say uh, much more production with stainless steel and all, uh, they started feeling that there, there are no raw materials in China. Okay. That's how they started going to Africa, Asian countries. They started going to Latin American countries, right? Basically, to get the raw materials, mm -hmm. iron ore, uh, bauxite, okay. gas, oil. That they got from the Latin America side. Yes. Okay. The African countries and all, mm -hmm. and which we missed. India could not do it. Still today, also India mm -hmm. is not able to do it, right? So, and the third is uh, the in China, because of the very political system, okay. they have one party one government huh. system, because of this, mm, they could really push things forward, okay. unlike ours. Mm. We have a democracy mm. at the center and democratic uh, units mm. in provinces and all, so you have to really bring them together. You have a different political party in the center, other party in these states. So we had a mismatch, mm. right, and very difficult. Whereas there, one political party, Communist Party of China, and government is the same, the party head is the same and the government is also the same, the mm -hmm. government head is also. So it was very, really easy for them to push the project forward. Okay, okay. And how do you see way forward? I would say particularly if we think about services sector in China. They are doing Manufacturing you have mentioned, you have given a very bright picture. How about the services sector? See, services sector also, I think Chinese are now gradually move on, moving towards services sector and okay. in the services sector management uh, India has done pretty well uh -huh. right uh -huh. we have institutions we have all the legal provisions enabling laws uh -huh. uh, in place to a large extent uh -huh. so in fact some of the Indian service sector uh, giants can think of going to China uh, for example, uh, like say, for example, in the uh, information technology service related services. Okay. Right? Chinese would be badly needing some of the services like this. Mm -hmm. uh, You're talking more about software or hardware? Both. Okay. Both. Okay. Uh, hospitality. Mm -hmm. Right? We uh, Chinese opened their tourism sector pretty late. Mm -hmm. Whereas we have a huge tourism sector in our country. But still they are getting more tourists than yeah, Absolutely. Else. <laughs> That's what, but the, as far as the service provisions are concerned, mm -hmm. I think we are far ahead. Okay. Right? In terms of laws, in terms of regulatory mechanisms. So I think we should uh, <coughs> think on that line. In certain areas like pharmaceuticals, uh, Chinese would not allow India because they know that uh, Indian pharmaceuticals are much cheaper than Chinese. Right? So this is where we really have to uh, negotiate with the Chinese. Okay. Now, how about the education sector? Because that also we consider as a part of the services sector. How do you overall see the education ecosystem of China? You see, in education, I think, uh, I would say, except to the top 
five ten universities in China, uh -huh. including uh, Peking, right, uh, Fudan, uh -huh. Shanghai, uh -huh. Sichuan, uh -huh. right. Except the top ten institutions, fifteen institutions in China, I think university education system is far more, uh, and the college education system is far more comprehensive, far more efficient in India. I would feel okay. Yes. Okay. Of course, now Chinese have a large number of people who graduate, who have graduated in other countries, including UK and USA and Canada, and all these are started coming back. But institutionally, I think the education system, the cost programs, the human resources we have in our country, uh, we are we are much better. So I would feel uh, Chinese standard would be slightly relatively lower than Indian standard. Is it so? Uh, in, in many areas. In How about research? Uh, research, yes. That is an area where Chinese far uh, are far ahead of India. Research, okay. uh, R&D. Okay. Because uh, of two, three things. One is uh, the private sector in Chinese. Hmm. I employ, say for example, Oppo, hmm. uh, Huawei, hmm. by any of you, if you take any of these, they devote a lot of resources in R&D activities there. Okay. Uh, then, of course, the government, hmm. all the public sector units, uh, government devotions to science and technology. Hmm. Whereas, in our case, uh, except one or two private sector, I don't think private sector is really interested in doing any R&D activities. Our R&D activities are totally driven by the government, one. Secondly, our, our contribution of funds in R&D in India is relatively much, much lower than what Chinese do, oh. right? Mm -hmm. And this is very clear from the way the Chinese get patents, oh. the Chinese gets uh, the intellectual property rights. Oh. You know, they are far, far ahead than mm -hmm. uh, India. Mm -hmm. How about infrastructure development? Well, infrastructure development, there is no match uh, to China because they build infrastructure thinking what they require in the next 50 years. Yes. And we bring, we build infrastructure uh, depending upon what really happened yesterday and what we require today. <laughs> so it is a very, ours is a very, very, what you call it, very, very short sightedness. Very, very uh, short-sightedness and very incremental process. We move only this much, mm. Mm. right? Mm. Say, for example, when Prime Minister Atul Bihari Bajpayee was there, he brought this concept of a golden quadrilateral mm -hmm. highways, mm -hmm. north, south, east, west, mm -hmm. and that was in 2001, 2002, 3, 4, 14 years. Still, we have not been able to. And uh, the way the way Chinese uh, do it, they have a they have a time bound program, a resource bound program, and they have a strong standard, a very strong accountability. In our case, we do not know. Look at the projects in the northeast. It has some projects are under uh, are under construction for the last 20 years. Nobody is really bothered about it. Right? Whereas in China, no, not. This has to be done this, they have done this. And that is why I find uh, the Chinese ways of constructions, Chinese ways of uh, doing infrastructure projects are, are being you know, replicated in even a country like Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sri Lanka. Many other countries. Right? I recently visited Cambodia. Hmm. And I was in a position to see that a lot of infrastructure is coming up which is being uh, constructed by Chinese and maybe some portion for Chinese and once again you know the entire development is taking place. Uh, what kind of a collaboration do you feel India and China can have uh, in higher education? See India and China it is in the you see you have uh, you have uh, a framework which we traditionally say that India and China are basically rivals. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Some of us even say that China and India are great enemies. But 
is that a right perspective no i don't think so because today it is not going to be a conventional hate for each other absolutely it's going to be basically the economic supremacy which has to be taken into consideration you can't avoid that that is one way of looking at it uh, the other way of looking at it is is there are countries uh, at the in the global world which would not like india and china to come together right because uh, way back i think uh, about 100 years back china and india together had almost uh, more than 50% of the global gross domestic product yes right yes uh, today we are hardly 20% 26% right so uh, what is what is very critical today is um, let's see which are the areas of convergence hmm. where we converge hmm. right we in only education in education if i focus on how do you look at that it's a great area okay education is one area where hmm. china and india can really work together hmm. right could there be some joint research project oh, yeah, yeah. in education education we can even we can even start from projects like our school education mm -hmm. there are a lot of things which india can learn from china and chinese can learn from india mm -hmm. right then you are in the higher education you have the technical education you have the professional educations then you have education related to uh, highly uh, top class research right every area where we can do together and there are institutions mm -hmm. and it's not that we have not started mm -hmm. Uh, many institutions have already started working mm. with the chinese mm. i see indian iits iims have got good relations with chinese mm. uh, counterparts right we would be focusing more on services sector because our chamber deals more with services mm. so i'm just trying to amplify over there like faculty exchange student exchange okay. research exchange some joint programs joint cultural programs and you know something related to higher education education skills capacity building something related to that how do you look at it you see the two things which we have to learn uh, from china is china is a country which really promotes skills oh. right very consciously promotes skills all kinds of skills traditional non traditional modern highly tech so 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 they have created such kind of uh, skills capacity building projects across the country mm -hmm. whereas in our country uh, we don't in some pockets yes we don't really uh, and we don't we don't have a culture of uh, uh, respecting skills mm -hmm. right you know a small cottage industry we do not nobody patronizes it dies down right that is i have noticed in uh, in china how to vertically horizontally integrate the skill development capacity building process okay. uh the second thing i noticed in china is um, they are very focused mm -hmm. right so for example uh, we always in india say that we are very good in traditional medicinal systems mm -hmm. like we have been doing in the northeast northeast is famous for traditional medicinal systems i like that uh, but in china every second shop in the market is a traditional medicinal system shop you have an allopathic medicine here chemist here you have a traditional medicinal shop here mm -hmm. side by side mm -hmm. and i see large number of more people going to tms traditional medicinal systems mm -hmm. shop than the allopathy mm -hmm. then in india where where is the where well, this kind of system exists then so mm -hmm. when that means they have made tms as competitive mm -hmm. traditional medicine as competitive as attractive and as efficient as any of the chemist shops there allopathic shops there right mm -hmm. and in that is there is a conscious policy they bring the faith healers traditional faith healers you know they are dependent on nature plants biodiversity and they bring it to the lab in the colleges private labs then they commercialize the product then they give it to private sector they deliver it to the global business so in chinese airports one of the most attractive thing in all the chinese airports is is a huge shops of traditional medicine systems 
Yes. Okay. Right? That means that means there is the government is consciously promoting them, people are getting jobs, employment, right? All kinds of and it goes down to the community mm -hmm. when you talk about PMS, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas tell me India, we have a IUS, we have mm -hmm. a ministry, mm -hmm. but have you ever seen any uh, you know, if you would like to really go for any Ayur Ayurvedic medicines, mm -hmm. where do you go? Is that it easily accessible? Okay. You really have to look for it. Okay. Right? So, first you have to find a shop, then you find to an area. Yeah. So, services place. sector, oh. right? On health, oh. Oh. you have a huge uh, score. score oh. Right? On uh, communications, you have a huge score. Uh, on tourism, you have a huge score. Higher education, you really have a scope, right? There will be large number of Chinese students who would like to come to India and study, right? Okay. With, with fellowship, without fellowship, without scholarships also. But we have not been, our visa system is so restricted oh. that we would not allow an ordinary Chinese to come uh, so easily. Okay. Right? In the second part, we will go a little more deeper into the education. We will also go a little more deeper into the northeast part of India and can we think of any institution or institutions in northeast part of India which is competent enough, capable enough and have the competence and expertise related to getting Chinese students and Chinese faculty uh, as a economic multiplier activity in the northeast part of India.